in the gospel today, we are told to beware of false prophets who have the appearance of being true followers of Christ, but whose real nature we can see from the results of following their teachings. Our Lord says very simply, by their fruits you shall know them. And the epistle warns us against ourselves so that we are not deceived, that we don't deceive ourselves. One of the greatest dangers in practicing our holy faith is to be deceived about what true virtue consists of. In our Lord's own time, there were the Pharisees who were leading people astray by their bad example. Our Lord said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And even though they taught the true doctrine to the people, they interpreted it in a false way and they used that for their own evil purposes. So our Lord had to warn the people about this. He said to them once, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in the chair of Moses. All things whatsoever they shall say to you, observe and do. But according to their works do ye not, for they say and do not. All their works they do in order to be seen by men. But if the Pharisees have the authority of God, or if in the time of our Lord they had the authority of God through Moses to teach the true religion, well, what should we say about the false teachers of today who don't have any authority from God and don't have the true faith either or, or the principles of the gospel? We see a lot of people today who claim to be the followers of Christ who don't teach his teachings. So they are ravening wolves. And no wonder what our Lord says, that false prophets will come to us in the clothing of sheep. Obviously, false prophets have to disguise themselves with the appearance of goodness, otherwise nobody would listen to them. But our Lord warned us, in the latter days there will be false Christs and false prophets who will show great signs and wonders to the point of deceiving, even if possible, the elect. So these false prophets that come to deceive us are not only people who talk to us in person, but maybe more frequently, more commonly, they come to us through, through the world around us. They come through, through the media, through entertainment, through the news and the internet, and the, the modern world. For example, in most movies and entertainment productions today, they seem on the surface to encourage a form of virtue. Good is shown in a certain way to triumph over evil in entertainment today, but at the same time, there are sins that are shown in a favorable light that are con encouraged and condoned, such as sins of impurity or anger or revenge and so on. And the worldview that is promoted in, in modern entertainment is completely lacking in any thought of God at all. So these things teach us to think that we can be good people without having any religion at all or any supernatural virtue of any kind. And these are very dangerous and very evil ideas. And they corrupt us without our even really being aware of it. These things are presented as sheep, but in reality they are dangerous wolves. But as our Lord said, by their fruits you shall know them. And the worldview that, that is shown again in the media today has absolutely nothing in common with the teachings of the gospel. And in fact it is diametrically opposed to it. And we see the fruits of the doctrines of this, this evil modern world that we live in. We see what St. Paul calls the works of the flesh, which are fornication, uncleanness, contentions, emulations, wrath, quarrels, and so on. But St. Paul says, of these things I tell you that they who do such things will not obtain the kingdom of God. So that is what will happen to us if we absorb the spirit of the world around us, if we don't protect ourselves from it, we will not obtain the kingdom of God and instead we will be sent to hell. 
This warning of our Lord is useful for us to distinguish false virtue from true virtue, not only in what we, we see in others, but even in what we see in our own souls, in our own conscience. Our Lord said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father who is in heaven, he shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So there are some Catholics who tell themselves they are going to be saved because they, they seem to themselves to be good Catholics. And they think that they are not guilty of any very serious sins in their own mind. But at the same time, sometimes they have some secret sins that they continue to commit. And they think that the, these sins maybe are only a small weakness but sometimes, in some cases, the, the, this secret sin they commit might be a serious sin. For example, someone who is a drunkard might think that he is not such a bad person because he is good to his friends, he is charitable to the poor, things like that. Or someone who is impure might tell himself that he is honest and sober and he doesn't take anything unjustly. And then an unjust person might tell himself that he's not all that bad because he gives a certain amount of money that he steals to the church. And in one way or another, we all try to, to justify and excuse our sins by balancing them out against some, vir some other virtue that, that we think we have, or maybe that we really do have. But this is not enough to get us to heaven. Or, or if we do this, does this mean we will go to heaven? Our Lord says it certainly is not. We can't be saved unless our justice is greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees. And the Pharisees had the idea that they were holy in reality as long as they looked like they were holy to other people. In their mind, that was their main goal, is to look holy to others. This is a very dangerous idea, though. It's, some way, it's one we have to be careful to avoid. It is not enough to keep only some of the commandments or, or to look to other people like we're keeping the commandments. We have to keep all of them without any exception. When God gave the commandments to Moses, he, said, he told Moses to tell the people that they have to remember all the commandments of the Lord and not follow their own thoughts and eyes going astray after diverse things. And in the New Testament, we see something similar in the epistle of St. James. He says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law but offend in one point is become guilty of all. For he that said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, also said, Thou shalt not kill. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. In other words, it only takes one serious sin to send us to hell. Now in avoiding evil, we also have to be doers of good works. Our Lord said, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit shall be cut down and cast into the fire. So just not sinning is not enough by itself. And St. James says again, What shall it profit if a man say he hath faith but hath not works? Shall faith be able to save him? And this is a rhetorical question, since we need both the faith and we need works of virtue and holiness in order to be saved. St. James says very simply, Faith without works is dead. So if we have fallen into any of these errors, then we ourselves are our blind leaders of the blind. We are our own false prophets leading ourselves astray. In our own mind, we look like a sheep to ourselves, but in the eyes of God, we are really a wolf. We have to practice fruits of holiness and justice. This means we have to practice virtue and avoid sin, and we have to adore God. 
and practice charity to our neighbor. We have to edify our neighbor by our good example. Our Lord said, I have appointed you that you should go go forth, you should go and should bring forth fruit. If all we can see when we look at ourselves is a wasted life full of opportunities of virtue that we have passed by and graces that we have neglected and even sins that we have committed, then we should have fear because that means that we are an evil tree that is not bringing forth good fruits and we will be cut down and cast into the fire. But in order to encourage us to change our lives, the epistle tells us to compare the fruits of sin and the fruits of virtue. People who devote themselves to a life of sin are never happy. They are being deceived by the devil who is promising them pleasure and contentment and the enjoyment of their senses in this world. But think about it. The devil is the most miserable creature in existence. How can he give to anyone else what he doesn't have himself? But when people pursue what the devil promises them, they find instead, obviously, only what the devil himself has, which is misery and discontent and disappointment. It says in Isaiah, There is no peace to the wicked, saith the Lord. It says in the Psalms, destruction and unhappiness are in the ways of the wicked, and they have not known the way of peace. And we see examples of this in the Bible. The classic example of King David, the great king of Israel, who fell into sin and was living a life of mortal sin for several years. And even at the height of his power, he was surrounded by all of the glory and and the pleasures of his royal palace. But his conscience was eating him up inside, so that he wrote in one of the Psalms, My tears have become my bread day and night, while it was said to me every day, Where is thy God? That was his conscience saying that to him. The separation from God that he knew was in his soul caused him to weep constantly. And then his son, King Solomon, said something pretty much the same. He said, Whatever my eyes desired, I refused them not. And I withheld not my heart from enjoying every pleasure and delighting itself. And I saw in all things vanity and vexation of mind. So all of the pleasures of this world only made Solomon restless and unhappy. The same is true, maybe more so, of everyone else, all of us. People who pursue sin in this world will all get those same results. So that St. Paul can truly say to the, the, the pagans who converted in his time, in his epistle today, he says, What fruit had you then in those things of which you are now ashamed? He's asking them to look back on the sins that they were committing before their conversion. He's asking them what benefit those sins gave them, knowing that the answer is is nothing at all. But if someone who pursues the sinful pleasures of this world will be this unhappy even in this world, what about the eternal misery that he is going to have in the next world that that God warns us about? Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit will be cut down and cast into the fire. And it is pretty obvious what fire our Lord is talking about. This is why Scripture very often refers to the sinner by calling him the fool. The word fool is used very often in Scripture, but it doesn't mean what we use that word to mean now, just to say something rude to someone or to insult somebody's intelligence. No, the word fool in Scripture means someone who is living a life of sin. For example, our Lord told a parable about a rich man who said to himself, Take thy rest, and eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, 
Thou fool, this night they require thy soul of thee. Because the, the ultimate the ultimate of foolishness is to seek the things of this world at the expense of the next. But what a different mentality we see in the souls of people that keep the commandments and that love God. The Psalms tell us, Delight in the Lord, and he will give thee the requests of thy heart. If we make God our goal in life, if what we really want in life is just to love God and, and for him to love us, then we will have the requests of our heart. The Psalms promise that to us. This doesn't mean that we will win all of our lottery tickets that we buy or anything like that. No. This means that we will have what we want. We will have peace and contentment. That is really the only thing that anybody really wants, ultimately. Although people pursue it in different ways, sometimes very different ways. God will give that to us if we love Him. People that love God can even be surrounded by difficulties or trials in this world. But on the inside, they, were all, they are always founded on the solid rock of God's presence in their souls by sanctifying grace. That gives them a peace that is above all understanding. And their hope to be happy with God forever in the next world is a solid and unshakable hope because they know that God himself promises it to them and will infallibly make them happy forever if they do what God asks of them and love him and avoid sin. Let us always remember the words of St. Paul, the wages of sin is death, but the grace of God is life everlasting through Christ Jesus our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.